I am One Proper Varian, and today we're going to explore how good Victoria 3, the sequel that we all thought would never come, really is. In this review, I will tell you all that you need to know about the strengths and weaknesses of the game before you make your purchase decision. There is a lot that I can say about it after putting roughly 200 hours into the game. I played that much so that I could truly test all of the game's systems and give you a thorough opinion on its quality. Much like Crusader Kings 3 is focused on personalities and their stories, Victoria 3 is focused on your country's evolution. Like its prequels, it throws you into a 100 year period centered around the post-Napoleonic era and lets you explore the period of unrest, imperialism and industrialization from many different perspectives. While Victoria Revolutions and Victoria 2 also attempted to bring this dynamic world to life, Victoria 3 has decided to carve out its niche as a society simulator more than ever before. The population system, for example, is superior to anything that I have seen elsewhere. The way the amount, occupation, wealth and education level of all those that make up your nation impacts your actual gameplay decisions is intense and unique. While you are always interacting with the very same systems, you will simply be facing a very different challenge as a Japan that has enshrined the power of its landholding population throughout its legal system compared to, for example, a game as one of the German countries in which the landowners are not nearly as powerful and a burgeoning middle class is beginning to dominate the country's political system, creating the historical powder keg that would explode in 1848. The underlying systems that create this uniqueness are incredibly complex and can be overwhelming, but as the player gets to know them, everything begins to fall into place and becomes much clearer. The problem here is that the game does neither itself nor the player any favors as far as accessibility is concerned. Much of the vital information is hidden within the tooltips of tooltips of tooltips, denying especially newer players access to it. The direct connection to your population that the game attempts to create also struggles quite a bit because the population browser is cumbersome and does not deliver much of any actionable information, leading to the player consulting it extremely rarely. Still, the high quality of the population system is directly supported by the political and economic gameplay systems. The political system attempts to organically create the challenges and conflicts countries experience within this period. Instead of railroading the player and the world too much, many historical trends, directions and events lie in waiting in case the circumstances lead up to them. In general, the political system works beautifully. The tug of war between the different interest groups that represent your overall population is ever present and requires you to sometimes make decisions that may not be optimal objectively, but set you up just right. Since Victoria 3's primary design goal is national gardening, you can see the political system as a rather potent tool to till the ground. The strongest moments emerge whenever the player receives a new wave of ideology and their interest groups may or may not pick those up. First, a wave of republicanism and liberalism sweeps the world and threatens the old order. Later on, socialism, suffragette movement and revanchist ideologies make appearances as well. Regardless of whether you want to destroy these ideological seeds or watch them grow, Vicky 3's political system will propose clear paths if you manage to give the power to the right parts of your population. Surprisingly to some, one of my favorite parts of this system can be found in political parties. I generally prefer to have some sort of elections just so that I can see which direction the wind is blowing. Seeing my German Republic form fascist and hardline nationalist parties after liberalizing too fast and losing a war, or seeing my Italian parties attempting to outbid one another by forming the left, the far left and the communist party were the dynamic experiences that enriched especially the late game significantly. The downside of the system, as it is right now, is that the massive interconnectivity between your society and the political reality also means that any unbalanced sections of it will not just lead to wacky but even frustrating experiences. Not once have I seen Japan restore the emperor, not once have I seen nationalist movements take apart the Ottoman Empire, not once have I seen the American Civil War take a somewhat logical part. The good news is that this is not as much a systemic issue as it is simply a result of balancing. And balancing is particularly hard with a system this complex. Additionally, revolutions, be it against the AI or the player, are simply not potent enough right now. While I have witnessed plenty of revolutions against the AI, the resulting revolutionary regimes oftentimes only change one or two laws, rarely truly shaking up the status quo of their country. On the player side of things, it is simply too easy to completely avoid revolutions in any given playthrough. This means that most of your campaigns will be reformist in nature. Whether that is towards a more liberal or more regressive status quo, it is the same either way. The violent revolution that led to the existence of the Soviet Union historically speaking will, as it stands, probably be a quiet introduction of socialist legislation instead, or a quiet suppression through an institution. On the other hand, the economic and market systems of Victoria 3 are almost free of blemishes entirely. 
The way the supply chains can be combined, altered, and set up in ways that make different segments of the population poorer or richer, and the way that you can work towards autarky or be an economy heavily relying on imports and exports are unmatched. The economic system takes certain shortcuts to make itself work, but ultimately creates a compelling case for itself that makes other market and supply chain games look like child's play. I absolutely love to compare the economic gameplay of Victoria 3 to building up your Anno 1800 economy, except you have infinitely more ways and reasons to tweak things as your population and politics are drastically impacted by everything you do. And whenever you take one more step towards fully understanding the systems, it feels equally as rewarding as figuring out a good production layout in Anno 1800. Working with individual markets has also proven to be the right choice, as it creates a great interplay between different powers. The only glaring systemic issue primarily stems from the way overseas markets are set up. If whatever the current patch is happens to cause too many revolutions in AI countries, being in a market in which you rely on a convoy connection to the market capital, you will suffer. Playing in the British Empire, for example, if the British are failing to maintain their convoy infrastructure will directly lead to your country falling apart also, even if it otherwise could exist on its own. This may be a niche case, but it certainly is an issue. With the system being as it is, there is of course a lot to learn about it as well. New players will have an extraordinarily difficult time to properly understand supply chains, when more automated production methods may make sense, and in whose pockets the profit of any supply chain actually ends up. While this is unlikely to stop you from enjoying the game, as even ruining your economy can be an incredible amount of fun in this game, the accessibility could be far better than it currently is. I really want to stress at this point that anybody that has never played Victoria 3 in any capacity should do the tutorial as it is one of the best ways to ease you into the basic motions that Paradox has designed so far. However, the lackluster level of accessibility is partially because the user interface rarely shows all the information needed or even encourages making wrong decisions. A good example here is that the predictive values that are meant to show whether a building will be profitable or not for food factories will be categorically wrong, especially when first building them. The game will almost always announce that this building is as good as a clipper factory in Victoria 2's late game, but it will also almost always be wrong about this. Not to mention, of course, that the predictive value, even whenever it is accurate, will oftentimes be a useless number for experienced players. My coal mines are rarely meant to be very profitable, if at all. That shouldn't mean I shouldn't build them. They are simply a necessity for expanding the industries they supply goods to. These difficulties and opaqueness of economic reasoning can lead to players feeling helpless when things do go awry. Most of the time, however, the market and economy systems work wonders and players will learn how to move from a reactive to a proactive playstyle of designing not just your economy, but also push your country's population and politics into the direction they desire. Much like political ideologies will throw itself at your country, new needs for resources such as dye, sugar, fruit, oil or rubber will emerge and create an organic desire to claim your place under the sun and to maintain your market as well as possible. All in all, the internal gameplay aspects of the game are exquisite and create a living, breathing world. The onboarding process, however, is simply not good enough as it stands and the user experience in general terms should urgently receive attention. The other side of the coin, of course, is the external gameplay that you do with your country, colonization, diplomacy and warfare. Colonization fundamentally is a nicely designed system, which is interwoven with your country's domestic politics as even being allowed to colonize is locked behind the law. You will also have a much more interesting experience interacting with the natives whose land you are claiming compared to, for example, Victoria 2. But sadly, that interaction is very limited in its scope. Should you colonize too aggressively, the natives will rebel, fail and you are gifted the rest of their land. There's virtually no drawback to simply do this, rinse and repeat. This oftentimes will lead to fairly odd-looking Africa maps. Fighting the centralized local nations as they exist, for example, in West Africa, is almost always far more costly and therefore unattractive than simply quietly taking over decentralized countries. On top of that, the crises that could spark in Victoria 2 from two powers being interested in the same region that they are claiming through colonization are simply absent. Other countries will very rarely truly rival a competent player's push for colonies and will challenge them for already settled land even less often. Seeing as there are no purely colonial wars in the game as of release, why would France ever challenge German colony efforts in Africa if that meant a full-on European war? This directly plays into the diplomatic experience overall. Many of the diplomatic systems in the game work quite well, but the player will all too often encounter systems that are either too rigid or too flexible. For an example of gameplay being too flexible, it is too easy to pick apart foreign customs unions as the other side essentially lacks an option to respond properly. While this fearing minigame in Victoria 2 was dreadfully tedious, it at least pitted the two powers struggling for a minor power against one another, rather than beside each other trying to gain favors from the minor power. 
For an example of gameplay being too rigid, if a nation has a number of vassals, these vassals will never be able to coordinate rebellion in any way. My all too famous Holy Roman Empire game would be much more exciting if a game system existed in which vassals and overlords would communicate in multilateral efforts and start diplomatic plays together, even against each other. Even if, at that point, any of my vassals were to openly rebel, they would always be the only one, as all others would be forced into the diplomatic play against them. Excessive rigidity and excessive flexibility can be found throughout the diplomatic aspects of the game. Mind you, plenty of aspects of diplomacy work quite well, especially trade agreements, voluntary customs unions, alliances, defensive pacts and smaller nations backing down in diplomatic plays against them. Still, why am I unable to release countries without them taking some of my core territory with them like the United Baltic Duchies right here? Why am I unable to transfer states to my vassals at all? Why am I unable to add war goals to a war in the name of somebody that joined my side already if they would love to have that war goal? The skeleton of diplomacy in Victoria 3 is good, but its limitations can be felt far too often even if one is merely a casual player. The complete absence of true multilateral diplomacy outside of diplomatic plays makes an appropriate emulation of the historical conditions impossible. Important events or institutions such as the Berlin Conference, the Holy Alliance, the German Confederation, the British Empire, the League of Nations or the Congress of Berlin are not represented and with that leave behind a vital space. Warfare, on the other hand, is troubled not because of the limitations of the underlying systems, like diplomacy, but rather because of its execution. When everything works, warfare is a wonderful depiction of the economic, political, financial and diplomatic capabilities of a country. A massive country with a weak industrial base and an undereducated population will not be able to field the same quality of troops as a tiny country that is an economic and social powerhouse. More than ever before, the results that one achieves in actually molding the nation play a massive role when competing with one's enemy on the battlefield. Not just that, but warfare also genuinely changes. The pre-industrialized countries of the early game fight wars that they can barely sustain for long. They fight battles that end with sizable land grabs, land grabs that are then the deciding factor in whether a war ends or not. Then, with the late 19th century and beyond, trench warfare enters the scene and land grabs are small if they at all occur after battles. Suddenly, deciding factors in a war are whether your finances, economy and starving population can bear the cost any longer, and you might find yourself wondering whether it is actually all worth it. Only for you to later re-emerge with the late game production methods that once again speed up warfare, overcome the trenches and permit for bigger land grabs as your planes, tanks and bicycles assault the enemy. I am personally a big advocate of expanding the military system by, for example, adding officer academies and such, further letting you personalize your armed forces as an expression of your country's identity, but on the battlefield. But when it works, warfare, as it already exists, is a working amalgamation of the country that you have built. When it works. And this is the crux of the matter. Warfare simply does not work often enough. There are two main vectors of criticism I want to focus on here. Warfare is far too opaque and warfare is far too buggy. When examining a hostile country, for example, much of the information that will be visible to you will not actually be what should guide your decisions. These numbers here are useless. What really matters is checking your enemy's production methods so that you can accurately predict whether they are better off than you and their market to see whether even if they were better off than you can sustain themselves if presented with a war. As I said, your armies are a result of the rest of your gameplay. You can go up against a technologically superior enemy, but if they immediately have ammunition shortages and their market effectively breaks down upon mobilizing their army, they are nothing more than a paper tiger. On top of that, looking at a frontline in itself will oftentimes give you a completely wrong impression of your odds. This frontline right here, my troops have better ingredients, better pizza, better money, their clothes are better, their shoes are better, and they even work harder. They are so superior in their quality that the enemy's numbers mean absolutely nothing. On the other hand, you will also see positive frontline numbers while you're losing. The reason, more often than not, can be found deep inside of a submenu when you realize that your troops may be superior but their supply has suffered, or their morale is recovering too slowly for the amount of fighting going on at the frontline. It's this jungle of UI a player needs to breach that is a massive, massive hurdle. Nowhere is it explained why generals attack where, how generals of each side are chosen, how it is determined how many troops each general brings to a battle and so on. On top of that, there will also be wars such as this one. I don't think I need to explain anything that you can see on screen right here. The aforementioned issues of mechanical transparency already stand in the way of the war system from an informational point of view, but as I said previously, the real issues stem from when the system refuses to work properly. The version currently in Victoria 3 is far too finicky and buggy because of this. 
Alpha generals win their front and assign themselves to an empty front in Africa instead of the neighboring front with Russia. Alpha generals simply unassign themselves entirely and Alpha generals remain mobilized despite no war going on, which led to me bleeding money. I also had to find out painfully that a fleet planning a naval invasion can only do this with an army that is based in the same HQ as the navy. The amount of considerations the player needs to dance around and needs to manually track because of bugs or overly rigid mechanics is too much to make the system good as it is currently implemented. Warfare when it works is an event that pitches your nation's social, technological, economic, political and financial capabilities against your enemy. Warfare when it doesn't work is incredibly frustrating. When we sum it all up, the internal mechanics of this game are in an incredibly great spot, even though there may be space to expand upwards mechanically and UX-wise. While there are issues, the underlying systems of your nation are more complex, organic and meaningful than any other game that I have played before. Externally, players need to do a bit of a dance around diplomacy being too rigid or too flexible and around the finicky information delivery as well as the bugs of warfare. All in all, I would give this game a 7.5 out of 10. Its systems are incredible, but it should have received much more polish before its release. If you are a fan of the Victorian era, analog supply chains and or society simulators, then this game will still be more than worth your time, even with all of the issues. I am on proper variant, you are you, and I will see you later. Alligator.